One of the practices that I engage in uh, each year as I think about what to preach on is I try to always preach on Jesus uh, at least one series a year out of one of the four Gospels, those four books in our New Testament in the Bible that tell us about the stories and the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus our Lord, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'd like to begin a series on the book of Luke today. Uh, And I think this is important because Jesus is right at the center of who we are as Christians. He is the center of our faith. Without Jesus, there is no Christian faith. And so it's good for us to always keep coming back to Jesus and learning about Jesus and making, making sure Jesus is the center of who we are and what we are all about. So we'll begin a a study of the book of Luke today, continue it on uh, through um, the first part of April, finish right around Easter time uh, with the stories that Luke finishes with, which are the stories around Jesus' resurrection. It'd be just right for, uh, for that time. Today we'll look at two stories from Luke chapter one. Next week we'll look at the story of Jesus' birth. Today we'll look at two stories that precede the birth of Jesus. Here's the first story, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is our first of two stories this morning. An angel appears to this Jewish priest Zechariah. He's just a normal priest. He doesn't have any special rank that we know of. He's married to Elizabeth, and they have a problem, something Zechariah has apparently prayed to God about over the years because the angel says, your prayer has been heard. They have no children. Elizabeth is unable to conceive. Now, they're not childless because they sinned 
in some way, or God's punishing them. Actually, Luke says they're both righteous, observing all God's commands blamelessly. They've just never been able to have a child. And now they're old and it's too late. But this angel appearing to Zechariah in God's temple of all places announces they will have a child, a son, and they are to name him John. Later, people will call him John the Baptist. Zechariah has to be totally stunned here. There were enough priests in Israel at this time that just being chosen by Lot to be the priest who got to enter the temple proper and offer incense to God one day might have been a once in a lifetime opportunity for Zechariah. He may have been waiting all his life for this opportunity. So then, as all his attention is, I imagine, on performing his duties perfectly, suddenly everything's interrupted by this angel. And the angel gives a bizarre message. You and your wife are going to have a son. Name him John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will turn people back to God and back to each other. And so on. Zechariah, in this overwhelming moment, asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? After all, I'm old and so is my wife. And to prove his words would come true, the angel strikes Zechariah mute until the child is born. Now the second story. Luke 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is our second story and Luke's first story about Jesus. The same angel appears to a virgin named Mary. She's probably a teenager. Most Jewish girls got married in their teens at that time. She's pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. The angel obviously thinks very highly of her Young as she is, he calls her highly favored and says that she has found favor with God. It is encouraging when we're young to know that God does not favor those who are older because they are older, but he grants his favor to everyone who trusts in him. The angel has a message for Mary, and it's even more shocking than his message for Zechariah. She, a virgin, is going to conceive and bear a son, the son of the Most High, and he will rule over Israel. Mary must have been as overwhelmed as Zechariah. And at this unbelievable moment, she, like Zechariah, asks a question. How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel responds that God will cause this to happen 
through the Holy Spirit. Mary receives this message and she tells the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. The name of the angel in both of these stories is Gabriel. Same angel in both stories. He's one of only two angels in the Bible whose names we know. The other is the archangel, Michael. Gabriel had also appeared to the prophet Daniel a little over 500 years before these things happened. That story is in Daniel chapters 8 and 9. And so Zechariah and Mary have surely heard of Gabriel. Gabriel has been entrusted with a tremendously important task, announcing to these prospective parents the miraculous conception and birth of, to the older couple, a great prophet, and to the young virgin, the son of God. Now, both Zechariah and Mary ask a question of Gabriel. And what I want to focus in on with you today is how Gabriel responds to their questions. Because he responds to them very differently. And his response, different to each of them, teaches us something important about doubt and about how to use doubt to build up and not tear down our relationship with God. See, Gabriel strikes Zechariah mute when he questions. But Gabriel doesn't do anything at all to Mary. Why the difference? One possible reason for the difference in Gabriel's response to these two individuals is their differing status. Zechariah ought to know better than to question an angel of God. Zechariah is a priest. He is standing inside God's own temple. And Zechariah has been around a long time. He knows well the story of how God gave Abraham and Sarah a miraculous son when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. If anyone ought to know better than to question God's message given through an angel, it should be Zechariah. Mary, on the other hand, is young. She's probably a teenager. She's not in the temple she doesn't yet have decades of experience with God. And frankly, she's a virgin. The mechanism by which a woman might become pregnant has not yet become available to her. And so their differing status probably made a difference in Gabriel's responses to them. But there's something else, too. They both question Gabriel... They both express doubt of a sort, but their doubt is different. Zechariah expresses skeptical doubt. He says, how can I be sure of this? Like, as if to say, what? This doesn't make any sense. You're telling me we're going to have a child? We're, we're too old. You're going to have to show me a sign to prove that this is really going to happen. He, he takes this attitude with the angel who is standing in front of him inside God's temple. And I imagine at that moment, maybe Gabriel gave Zechariah the look that my parents used to give me when I was a kid, and, and I said a little more than I ought to have said. You know, kind of that folding the arms, cocking the head to the side a little bit. And Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. Maybe you've heard of me. I stand in the presence of God. You get to serve in the temple. I stand in God's own presence. And you have the audacity to not believe my words? So then he gives Zechariah a sign to prove that his word really is from God, that it is true. He strikes Zechariah mute. And uh, Terry and Patsy, we find out later in verse 62, that Zechariah is also struck deaf because people have to sign to communicate with him. He cannot hear them. The angel strikes Zechariah mute and deaf. Mary, though, she expresses doubt too. 
but she expresses faithful doubt. She's not skeptical like Zechariah when she asks, how will this be since I am a virgin? She's not doubting God. She's trying to understand how God is going to bring this about because she doesn't know of any way this could could work. Does she need to go to Joseph and tell him that they need to get married tonight? Is that what God wants? Is she marrying the wrong guy? God has someone else in mind for her. What does God want her to do? How will this be? Gabriel explains that God will personally cause this new life to begin to grow inside of her. Mary just needs to be ready. And the difference between the tone behind Zechariah's question and the tone behind Mary's question is confirmed when Mary tells the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. It's interesting and it's uh, very encouraging that God is not offended by Mary's question here. God is not offended by our doubts in themselves because doubt has an important purpose in our walk with God. The proper purpose of doubt is to prompt us to pursue the truth. The proper purpose of doubt is to prompt us to pursue the truth. Doubt is simply the brain cocking its head sideways and saying, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. I'm I'm not sure this is right. God has given us brains capable of questioning the information they receive so that they can detect what is false and hold on to what is true. And so Mary hears the angel say she's going to bear a child. And in pursuit of the truth of what God has in mind for her, she asks, how will this be since I am a virgin? Later, as Jesus is teaching the people, we hear Jesus say, for example, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And if you've never experienced his rest before, you might well cock your head to the side and ask, wait, after all the trouble I've been through, all the things I've done, how can God give me rest? But when we ask, we must always ask with the right tone. Skeptical doubt causes us to lean away from God and to stop searching. I think Gabriel uh, probably just caught Zechariah off guard. Luke has told us Zechariah was a righteous and godly man, Uh, but uh, he had an off day here. If Zechariah had held on to his skepticism, though, he might never have experienced the blessing that God had prepared for him, this miraculously born son. Maybe God would have sent Gabriel to find someone else. Who knows? Skeptical doubt is doubt that says, why should I believe God? I can't believe it until you prove it to me. And then it walks away without investigating any further. And I wonder if maybe in some sense Gabriel struck Zechariah mute to break him out of skeptical doubt. Faithful doubt, though, causes us to lean into God and search more. Mary leans into God. She asks for more information, for instruction, for guidance. She's ready to believe. She just needs a little help. Faithful doubt is what drives you after last week's lesson from Philippians 4 to ask, if I do pray and petition and give thanks to God when I'm anxious, will God really give me his peace to guard me? And then to say, with everything I'm going through right now, it it sounds hard to believe, but because God has said it, I'll give it a shot. And then you find out that God's promise is true. That he can and does give us his peace. Faithful doubt wants to know. Wants to know if this is true. If God will really do this. And so it leans into God. And seeks him. To find out if God will really do what he says he will do. And it was not long before Mary found out. That yes, God can and does do 
what he says he will do. You've heard of Doubting Thomas. We call him Doubting because he was the one of the apostles who was not there when Jesus first appeared to the other apostles after his resurrection. And Thomas said, I, I won't believe that he's risen from the dead unless, unless I see him with my own eyes, touch him with my own hands. He had skeptical doubt, but to his credit, he changed and, and, or, or kept faithful doubt alongside it. He did not walk away from God, but he stayed with the other apostles just in case it was true. And sure enough, Jesus appeared to him along with the others and let Thomas see him and touch him. And Thomas came to believe. He had skeptical doubt. He also had faithful doubt, the two in his heart mixed together. It is fine to doubt. There's nothing wrong with doubting in itself. It can actually be very healthy. But don't stop there. Just don't stop there. When I was in school, one of my uh, New Testament professors, a uh, godly man, was a minister in the church, also uh, very faithful in his ministry and in his teaching, loves God deeply. His wife is just the same way. Beautiful Christian couple. They raised two, teenage, or two, two girls in the church, and when those girls were teenagers, one of them came to her dad, a New Testament professor, and said, Dad, I just don't, I don't believe in God. And it was hard for him to hear that, of course. He didn't, he didn't panic. He talked with her a little bit. He said, well, would you be interested in reading some um, books that I've read that help express why I believe in God? And she said, okay, I'll take a look at those. And sure enough, she read those books. She thought about it. And in time, she came to believe more strongly than ever not only that there is a God, but that Jesus is his son and that that was proved when God raised Jesus from the dead. And when I knew uh, this young woman as, as a young woman, she was tremendously faithful to God. She doubted, but she had the right kind of doubt, not skeptical, but searching for what is true. God said once through the prophet Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Doubt is not something to be afraid of or ashamed of if it's the kind of doubt that drives us to seek what is true. Because that kind of doubt will cause us to go in search of God, to lean into God. And those who seek God find him because God wants to be found by his children. Even if you struggle to believe the promises of God, Zechariah in this story offers us some good news. If we're seeking God like Zechariah was, then even when God catches us by surprise and we get stuck in doubt, if we're faithful, God can break us out of doubt. Look what he did for Zechariah. Luke 1 and now in verse 57. To wrap up Zechariah's story here. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father. Terry and Patsy, that's where we see the sign language there. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Old Zechariah didn't doubt anymore. God gave him and Elizabeth a son, and Zechariah was healed. God himself broke Zechariah free of his skeptical doubts. And God fulfilled his word to Mary, too. But we'll look more at Mary's story next week. If you have doubts about God, there is nothing wrong with that. 
as long as you don't stop there. Investigate. Find out what is true about God. Let your questions drive you to inquire further like Mary and to lean into God, not away from him. Go and find out what is true. A great way to start would be to just share in this series of lessons from the Gospel of Luke, or better yet, go home and read the book of Luke uh, on your own and uh, see what it says. Just see what's there and see if it makes sense. Don't be skeptical like Zechariah was in his moment of weakness. Go and search out the truth and don't give up until you find it. And as you seek out God himself and his will and his purpose for your life, say to him, like Mary, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. May God bless you. Let's pray together. Our dear God, you know our hearts and you know the questions that we have, uh, that we keep inside. You know, Lord, where we uh, might struggle to understand what you have in mind for us. You know where we might um, find it difficult to trust in your promises. You know, Lord, where we might... uh, be reluctant to obey you because we're just not sure. Dear Lord, we open our hearts to you today and we ask you to search them, to see our doubts, to, to, and then to work in our lives in ways that we can see and understand that we might know you better, that we might trust you more, that we might rely on your promises. Lord, when we're like Zechariah in his moment of weakness, be patient with us and help us. And then when we're like Mary and and we we just have questions, but we lean into you and we trust you, then Lord, do your great work in our lives and in our church. Help us as individuals to trust you. Help us as a church to trust you. Help us to walk with you in everything. Thank you for bearing with us when we doubt. Thank you for receiving our questions with grace. Thank you for your great love and for how you always reach out to us so that if we'll just seek you and and seek you with all our heart, we will find you. For you are the God and the creator who loves those he created, who wants to be found by us who have turned away from you. Lord, help us turn back to you and trust in you. Bless your church this week. Bless each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.